Thank you so much, Maya. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I just saw people popping into the chat and saying that where they were from. I wish I could say hello individually to all of you. Many of my friends and neighbors are here, and I really, really it's really great to see you. So I, I want to talk tonight about um, the mysteries and magic of Vermont's bogs and fens. And uh, you know, I don't know what mysteries are. I don't really know what magic is either, but I find bogs and fens mysterious and magical in, in my own way. And I just want to share some of that with you. It's uh, really um, been, been a lifetime of, of, um, of loving bogs and fens. And just to tell you a little bit where I came from with this, um, the first, my first encounter with the word bog was really having to do with cranberry bogs. I grew up in Eastern Massachusetts and a bog was a place where cranberries were raised and you had to stay off the bog to avoid damage to the vines. But in the, my hometown of Chelmsford, Massachusetts, there was a cranberry bog which was flooded every winter and it's where people went skating. So the bog was this, this was the bog and this is a picture of, of the cranberry bog. <laughs> frozen in 1971 and people skating on it that's how, that's what I knew of as a bog there's my dad my mom and there's me skating um, way back when and then the word fen how, what what did the word fen mean to, to me it meant Fenway Park that's pretty much the only my only encounter with the word fen as a child I didn't know what it meant um, but fast forward, I, I uh, went to college at the University of Maine um, from Massachusetts. And again, this is just for fun, these old slides. Uh, in my first uh, summer after graduating, I worked on Great Wass Island, which is a nature conservancy preserve on the coast of Maine. And, uh, and this was one of, that was one of my views. This was one of the views from where I worked. And this, it was a place where there were lots of bogs bogs everywhere covering this island and that was that was one of my introductions to really getting to know bogs and their vegetation in maine there are some fabulous bogs this one's called thousand acre heath or the it's actually called the great heath and uh it's, it's more than a thousand acres this is an aerial view of it fascinating bog um, but in the jonesport near where i lived on great Wass island there was this bog the jonesport heath which was mined for peat at the time. And it has since been abandoned um, and it's not no longer being mined, but um, at the time it was being mined actively for peat and you could go to the edge of the bog and see the peat mining apparatus going on. So you can see um, in this aerial view, you can see all the, all the ditches that were, that were put into the bog for mining. Um, having spent some time in Maine, I, so going back to this Jonesport Heath, I. Um, I worked for the Maine Critical Areas Program, and one of the things I did was to uh, facilitate the publication of a report by Ian Worley, who was at the University of Vermont, but uh, was doing some work in Maine at the time, studying Maine peatlands. And he identified through his work um, a bunch of significant peatlands in Maine. One of them was the Jonesport Heath. And um, I was actually um, told that because it was an active peat mine that we couldn't put it in the in the report. We couldn't put it as a as a natural area in a report on natural bogs of Maine because it was being actively mined. Um, so I actually lost a job over that. <laughs> um, but th when I came to then I came to Vermont um, to study under Ian Worley and to study peatland some more. I met Hub Vogelman, my other mentor here in Vermont. Um, and became interested in these kinds of peatlands and string pattern peatlands and went up to Shefferville, Quebec on the Labrador border um, to study them uh, for my graduate work. And this is a picture of the town and you can see the wild wildness in the background. Um, this is way in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the town was built for, for an iron mining project, um, but, but they have a field station there. So I went up there to do my studies. And then after that, um, I, I began working um, in Vermont as an ecologist and have uh, and remained in Vermont for, for the remainder of my uh, career and worked with Eric Sorensen and my colleague Bob Zeno. And we published this book, Wetland, Wetland Woodland, Wildland. 
Um, at the end of my, when I retired, um, one of the recognitions, a bunch of people put together this book for me, and one of them was Showy Lady Slipper. And this is a picture by John Binhammer, um, recognizing my love for Showy Lady Slipper and my love for bogs and fens. Um, so what is a bog and what is a fen and what is peat? So a bog, um, bogs and fens are peatlands. A peatland is land made of peat. What is peat? Well, so this is a bog, um, and you can see this is actually a bog in Ireland. And um, there are see those linear features in the bog are are not not drains necess ditches and drains necessarily, but they're places where the peat has been mined um, in this bog. So peat is partially decomposed organic matter. Simply put, it's just organic matter that has not fully decomposed because of lack of um, oxygen or the chemical environment or a combination of both. So peatlands are abundant in Ireland. Um, and there's the peat bank where uh, peat has been mined out of this, out of this peatland. Um, now, um, this is a really interesting, um, I, I put this publication up here, a global peatlands assessment, which was just completed at the end of last year. It's a really fascinating document. Uh, you should look it up. Um, but it describes the world's peatlands. And one of the things it does is it shows this, it, it has this wonderful map of peatlands um, throughout the world. And you can see where they are distributed. They're distributed mostly, mostly in the, in the uh, moister parts of the world. Um, and a lot of those moister parts of the world are in northern climates, uh, northern Eurasia, Siberia, and, and northern uh, North America. And you can see uh, around Hudson's Bay, there's just a, a vast abundance of, of peatlands. And this is where I was studying up in, in uh, the Quebec uh, Labrador area. Um, and the peatlands, one really fascinating thing about peatlands is they actually, they don't cover that much of the Earth's surface, but they store about 30% of the world's carbon. They are vastly more uh, carbon dense collectively than the world's forests. Um, so peat, here's a, just a, a picture of peat. Peat is simply, like I said, partially decomposed organic matter or almost undecomposed in some cases. Um, in this photo uh, taken by a friend, you can see the peat uh, lying on the ground that he took out with a soil auger. And this is going back to that Irish peatland, um, the peat briquettes that have been harvested from that, from that peatland. And then there they are being loaded on a, on a wagon. When I went to Ireland a couple of years ago, uh, my sister found this lovely, on the left, a lovely uh, handmade doll and of this man holding a bag of Irish turf, which is what they call peat. And uh, she gave that to me as a souvenir. And here is how peat is harvested in North America, typically, with these big vacuum harvesters, um, so that, that the peatland surface is, is cleared of vegetation, it's ditched and drained, and then these massive vacuum harvesters go over the surface and um, vacuum up the peat in very um, thin increments, about a centimeter thick at a time. And this is what we get from it, peat moss, which we use on our gardens and use in horticulture. Um, this is a publication um, when I was in, in Maine. This is a publication that, that I came across in 1909 publication about the peat deposits of Maine. And this is all about peat as an economic resource and where you could find it. And, and uh, you know, just a fascinating article, um, but all about where peat is and um, where it can be mined. Well, so that's a little bit about peat. Now I'm gonna talk about bogs and fens and what they are. So bogs and fens are peatlands. So they're land made of peat. Um, bogs are peatlands in which the water is, the, the surface of the peatland is separated, elevated from, removed a little bit from, for whatever reason, the regional groundwater table. And therefore it gets most of its nutrients from precipitation, from rain and snow and other precipitation. This is a bog, this is peach and bog um, in Groton State Forest. And, and a good example of, of a classic bog and one of our, actually one of our largest bogs and one of our only raised 
bogs in Vermont, that is the surface of it is raised above the water table. Now fens, fens are um, going back to my childhood in Fenway Park. Um, when I, you know, finally figured out what Fenway Park was referring to, it was referring to the Back Bay fens in Boston. So this is a picture of the Back Bay fens in Boston. Um, it's it's a waterway surround was surrounded. It was a wetland originally. Most of it has been filled in, um, but this this waterway remains through it, and some of the wetland features remain. So that's what fens are in Boston, and that name came from England. Uh, where the fen lands of East Anglia cover vast, vast areas of, of the northeastern part of England. Uh, and the, these are a couple of pictures of the fen lands of, of East Anglia, which also have been ditched and drained and converted to agriculture and, um, and you know, vastly <laughs> utilized. But there's a big movement af afoot now to, to restore them and um, bring them back to um, bring them back to natural area in some cases. But you can see in this picture over to the right, you can see how black the earth is, right? And that is that is peat. Um, and fens, um, the way so we have adopted the word fen to mean in North America something a bit different than what those East Anglian fens are. And we refer to we we use the term fen to refer to peatlands, which are fed by or influenced by groundwater, often calcareous groundwater moving through calcareous bedrock. And this is an example of a fen that I was in recently. You can see in this photo of this fen, it's quite different from the bog photo that I showed you, right? And the trees in the bog photo were larch and black spruce. Here we have Northern white cedar, and then the vegetation on the ground is uh, appears to be mostly uh, grass-like plants with a few of those little, little white whitish things scattered in are showy lady slippers. There are cattails mixed in um, and some other things. And the, the grass-like plants are mostly sedges. So the vegetation is quite different. And, um, and these are influenced by calcareous groundwater. So that's how bogs and fens different. There's a whole gradation between bogs and fens. Um, they're not, it's not all just, you know, one or the other in a box. It's a, it's a gradient. Back to bogs now. Um, so here we're back to peach and bog. Um, and again, you know, the, the plants that you see growing here, the yellow thing is larch uh, or, or tamarack and then black spruce. The other, the um, conifer there is black spruce. And on the ground surface, all that reddish stuff is mostly heat shrubs, shrubs in the heath family or the um, or the blueberry family. And then there's those white spots, which are cotton grass. Here's another bog, um, another just I'm just going to show a couple of pictures of different bogs and different ways that they can look. This is actually one in Maine. This is Saco Heath in Maine, um, very large open bog in Maine. And there it is again with a spindly and twisted um, pitch pine growing on it. This is another bog on the coast of Maine, thanks to Eric Sorensen for the photo. Um, and this is this hails from the town where, near, near where I, I got my start on Great Wass Island, um, way down east Maine. Here's another bog. Um, this take a photo taken of a Vermont Land Trust uh, conserved land um, by my colleague, Jennifer Garrett. And here's something that's really interesting about bogs. You often see the black spruce often has this lollipop sort of appearance to it. Um, and this is a bog in um, this in uh, Alberg. This is the Alberg, um, South Alberg bog. Bogs can also occur on mountaintops. This is Mount Mansfield. You, I'm sure you recognize it. And just over to your right, you can see those pom poms again of, of the um, cotton grass. So there is a bog. There's more than one bog, but there's one sort of good sized one on the top of Mount Mansfield. And you see that string in the photo that's to keep you off the bog <laughs> and to keep you on the trail. So do, please do stay on the trail when you're up there. And there's a couple more pictures of that bog. And here's just a picture of what you might see when you look closely at a bog. Again, this is from Eastern Maine, down East Maine. Um, and the, the uh, big leaf uh, on the lower right is a plant called cloudberry, which is not something that grows in, 
in Vermont, but uh, really only on the coast of Maine. But you can see you're looking down, you're looking down at some sphagnum moss, some sundew, and some pitcher plants, and some other trailing shrubs. Just a very typical view of a bog when you look close. Some of the plants that grow in bogs, I'm going to start with um, members of the heath family. So the heath family is the blueberry family um, in which we have azaleas and um, cranberries and um, all kinds of other things. The members of the heath family, this is a really interesting thing sort of physiologically, members of the heath family are especially tolerant of very acidic environments. And many bogs are very acidic. Um, they have, the, the water chemistry is such that the pH is very low, um, meaning very acidic. And for many, many plants, that is a problem. Many plants cannot grow well in acidic soils. We use limestone to amend our soils in agriculture and gardening because um, because limestone raises the pH, limestone, it's, it, limestone is um, calcium carbonate, and that raises the pH and, and makes nutrients more available for most plants. A higher pH makes nutrients most more available. The Heath family, members of the Heath family are an exception to this. They, their physiology is such that they actually do quite well in acidic environments, and sometimes you even have to acidify the environment for blueberries or rhododendrons or azaleas or other members of this family. This plant is uh, one of the most beautiful members of the Heath family. They're all beautiful, but I just love this plant. And this is Rhodora. Um, and there's a beautiful poem by Emerson uh, about, about Rhodora and um, one of the lines from it is, um, the sort of punchline of it is, beauty has its own excuse for being. <laughs> and uh, whenever I see the Rhodora, I think of that line, beauty has its own excuse for being. This um, photo was taken in Colchester Bog in, in May, around May 19th or 20th or so last year. And that's when the Rhodora blooms. So third week of May or so is a great time to get out into the bogs and see Rhodora in bloom. Um, it's one of the, the uh, members of the Heath family that does not have evergreen leaves. Uh, many of them do, but this one does not. And there's a closer look at the Rhodora. And there's the fruits of Rhodora. So you can see that the leaves are fresh and green. They're not evergreen. Um, but the fruits stick around. These are last year's fruits, actually, um, the, the previous year's fruits. And there's another look at the fruits um, before they've actually burst open. Another member of the Heath family that's very common in peatlands, in bogs, and also in fens, but very common in bogs, is sheep laurel, um, related to mountain laurel and looks very much like it. Um, but it's a sm much smaller plant. So sheep laurel is uh, it's Calmia angustifolia, if, if you want to know the scientific name, but, but one of the um, very common members of the heath family that does do quite well in acidic environments, very common in, um, in bogs. And I'm showing this picture because <laughs> here, is, uh, here is the sheep laurel growing right like right out of the right next to the boardwalk at Colchester Bog in Colchester, a great place to go and visit. And there's what it looks like in the winter. So it does have evergreen leaves um, that turn orange, orangish, um, very beautiful in the fall. And then through the winter, those leaves stay on through the winter. A related plant, another plant in the Heath family, look, it looks very, very much like the sheep laurel. And this one's called bog laurel. I'm just going to back up for a sec because if you look at the sheep laurel leaves, well, let's look at this. You'll see how the leaves are arranged in like there's three leaves in one place on the stem, whereas here there are two leaves in one place on the stem. So it has opposite leaves. 
and this is uh, this is bog laurel, a much more a much smaller, more diminutive plant, uh, but a lovely plant that grows commonly in bogs. And here it is later. Um, this is in the taken in the fall, and you can see that the older leaves turn this bright, beautiful, shiny red in the fall. Another plant in the heath family that's common in bogs is uh, bog rosemary. This one has very long sort of bluish green leaves that remind one perhaps of rosemary, the culinary herb, but there's no relation and you do not touch bog rosemary or use it. Um, in fact, many of the members of the heath family are poisonous, including sheep laurel, which is also called lamb kill. Uh, so it is poisonous um, to livestock and, and uh, to humans. So we don't we don't go near them. This is bog rosemary in flower, um, beautiful little bell shaped flowers. That and then you can see here you can see the resemblance to to blueberries. Here's another one. Um, this is uh, this is a better photo. This is a, a photograph of um, leather leaf, another member of the heath family. Look at those dots on those leaves. It's just the most fascinating thing. Little sort of scurfy dots on the leaves. That is leather leaf, another member of the family. And then here is Labrador tea, um, the close up of the flower of Labrador tea. And there's a little bit of a zoomed out look at Labrador tea. Look at those hairy leaves. These are the new, those are just in the lower right of the, of the flowers. Those are the new leaves of the year. And then you can see out of focus in the background, the leaves of the, of the former year um, that, are, uh, that are evergreen. But they're very fuzzy. The leaves are very fuzzy, um, particularly underneath. And as they mature, the fuzz turns the cinnamon color. Labrador tea actually is used, used for tea and so is um, not poisonous, obviously. Uh, but it is easy for the uninitiated un, uh, or whatever to um, confuse it with sheep laurel or lamb kill. And that has been done and people have actually died from that. So be very, very careful. Um, and here is Labrador tea in its, uh, in its fall guise. Again, turns very orange and beautiful. And here is highbush blueberry uh, in just profuse flower in, um, in, again, this was in Colchester Bog in May. And there are the berries forming up on the highbush blueberry. This is what high bush blueberry looks like in the fall. Beautiful red color. Um, another member of the Heath family, a much smaller one, is this one, which is small cranberry. Uh, so these flowers are, oh, less than a half an inch across. And the whole plant is about three or four inches tall. And you can see the shiny green leaves to the left in this photo. Um, very tiny, um, very tiny, shiny leaves. And there's another image of cranberry, small cranberry. So there are two species of cranberry that grow in Vermont, small cranberry and large cranberry. The large cranberry is the one that has been cultivated um, in the bogs of, of Cape Cod and, um, and southeastern Massachusetts. They're both edible, both both uh, species have edible berries, but the larger one obviously has larger berries and um, makes a more um, economically viable crop. Uh, cranberries are raised in Vermont. Um, there's a there's a farm in Westford, I believe, that raises cranberries and and sells them commercially. Um, this is Alpine bilberry, another member of the Heath family. And this is growing in that bog on top of Mount Mansfield. And there it is, there's the leaves of it. This one is um, mountain cranberry, a, a pretty rare species in Vermont. Um, and this again was taken on the top of Mount Mansfield. You see those shiny green leaves and the flowers again of mountain cranberry. Okay, some sedges. This is um, this is a cotton grass that was this is uh, on the top of this was from the top of Mount Mansfield. When I went to visit Mount Mansfield um, to visit these bogs, this was last year uh, that I went up there. 
I went to the ranger station and talked to them and told them what I'm what I was doing. They said, "Oh, you got to go see the pom poms. You got to go see the, the the trefula grass." Is another way she described it. It was it was fun, um, and there it is, close up. One of the many species, there are maybe a dozen species of um, of cotton grass that grow in the wild in Vermont. Some of them are quite rare. Um, this one is is um, one that's most common on the mountaintops. This is another one. This is actually a different species that looks very similar from a distance, but this one is growing in the South Alberg Swamp, and this one's called tawny cotton grass. And there's a close-up view of tawny cotton grass in its earlier stage, and you can see why it's called tawny. It's, it's got a sort of brownish color to it. Here's another sedge. There's lots of sedges that grow in bogs. Um, uh, and I'm not going to name them all. This one's few fruited sedge. There it is again. Um, this is one called Carex oligosperma. Uh, thanks again to my friend Jennifer Garrett for taking this photo. Um, and then there are other things that other species that grow in bogs. You, you can recognize the bilberry, the alpine bilberry in this photo from what I showed you before, those greenish roundish leaves, but the most of what's in this photo is crowberry, black crowberry, which grows on the top of Mount Mansfield. And you may have heard in the news that they discovered a different species of crowberry on the top of Mount Mansfield as well, a rare species that had thought, that was thought to have been um, extinct in Vermont. Another plant that grows in bogs um, is and in swamps is um, Winterberry holly, Ilex verticillata, one of my favorite plants. Um, and the winterberries are, this is in the holly family. Um, it is a, uh, so it's, and, and there it is again, closer up. And it's a deciduous holly. So the leaves, uh, although they're quite um, leathery looking, they actually do fall off. It's, it's not an evergreen like the holly that's used in Christmas decoration. But you can see the similarity of the leaves, the sort of spiny edges to the leaves. And there it is in winter. Um, you can see the snow in the background. And this photo, to be honest, was not taken in a bog. This was taken in a... Um, <laughs> In uh, right next to Starbucks in Williston, uh, because they plant this. This is this is planted. Um, various varieties of of um, winterberry holly are planted as ornamentals because they're so so beautiful and keep their berries in the winter. Um, they do keep their berries in the winter as long as the birds don't get them. <laughs> so we planted uh, at home. My my husband and I planted um, some winterberry holly. Uh, as an ornamental because we love the berries and it's doing really great but as soon as the berries are mature enough the bluebirds just come flocking to them and just take all the berries strip all the berries from the bushes and there's nothing left so we don't have this appearance in the in the middle of winter um, apparently the birds don't get to starbucks very much Okay, other interesting plants that grow in bogs are the plant, there's a whole set of plants that are carnivorous, that consume, get their nitrogen by consuming animals. And you've heard of this. Uh, they're insectivorous plants. This one's sundew. This one's intermediate leaf sundew. And look, it's devouring a moth or something uh, in, this, in this photo. So it's got these sticky um, hairs, the hairs with, with the glandular hair. So that, that knob at the end of the hairs is a sticky substance that causes the insect to get stuck. And then you can see that the leaf actually sort of bends over the insect and um, so that it can be consumed, it can be digested uh, by the plant. Um, a pitcher plant is another one, another one of the um, the insectivorous plants that we have in our in our peatlands, um, bogs, and fens. You can see in this photo, and then in this photo as well, that there are hairs on the inside of the, the pitcher is a leaf that has been adapted to form a, a closed pitcher 
the rainwater comes into it and stays there. It has no way to get out. So there's a pool of water in there. And then there are hairs on the inside of the leaf surface that are pointing downward. So if an insect lands on, and you can see there, it looks like there's an insect, maybe that did just land on the, on the tip of this. If, if an insect lands on this, it'll slide down in and cannot get back out. They can't get back out because those hairs just keep it down in there. And so in the water in the, um, in the pool down in there, is, uh, has a chemical in it produced by the plant, uh, an, an enzyme that actually digests the animal, the insect, and, um, and, and creates the, the food that is absorbed by the plant, the nitrogen. This is the flower of pitcher plant, um, really fascinating and beautiful flower, um, bright, bright red, and the, the um, petals, the things that are hanging down are the petals the shiny red things that sort of form that umbrella, flat umbrella at top are the sepals, the outer part of the plant. And then the inner part is actually a, a stigma and that's a, a landing pad where the insects can land. So you can see in this photo um, that the petals are gone, but that stigmatic surface is, is there you can, so that you can see it more clearly. It's, and that is uh, just this big landing pad for insects. Other plants that grow in bogs, this is um, aronia and uh, black chokeberry. Um, this is a really fascinating one. This is a, a parasitic plant that grows on black spruce called dwarf mistletoe. There's a closer picture of it. And then there are the mosses. There are peat mosses. And there are uh, a couple of dozen species of peat moss that grow in Vermont. Um, there's at least two species in this photo, thanks to Eric Sorensen for this photo. One of them is called Sphagnum rubellum, which is red, uh, it means red. Um, and there's Sphagnum rubellum again. And um, I'm not gonna name all the species because I don't know them, um, but there's a number of species. This is a really fascinating moss, thanks to my friend Grace Glynn for this photo. Um, this is uh, called moose dung moss. <laughs> moose dung moss grows on moose dung, only on moose dung. And uh, there are the fruiting capsules of moose dung moss um, growing on moose dung. So she found this in a bog in the northeastern part of the state where we do have moose. It's kind of an uncommon moss. Okay, for fens now, um, we're going to transition over to fens. And this photo is an aerial photo of Chickering Bog. And Chickering Bog is not really a bog, it's a fen, <laughs> but um, it has some aspects of bog and some aspects of fen. But it's really interesting to look at it here from the air because you can see it's this sort of teardrop shaped thing. And um, what you can't really tell is that the, the surface watershed is actually, this is actually high on a plateau. This is very high on a plateau in the town of Callis um, on the border of East Montpelier. And there's very little surface watershed to this. There's not a lot of um, surface water coming down from the hills surrounding it. But a lot of the water comes to it through the bedrock, actually just seeping through the bedrock. And at the edge of this peatland, you can see where that seepage is, is sort of springing up into the peatland. And um, we, this, uh, this is an upside down picture, I apologize. But one of the things about, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna come back to that in a second, but here is um, another picture of, of uh, you've already seen this picture of a fen. Um, this is Chickering Bog itself. Um, the view from the boardwalk at Chickering Bog, it has a central pond, which you saw from that aerial view. Another view of Chickering Bog. This is a fascinating photo because you can see the browse line, the deer browse line on the northern white cedar in Chickering Fen. And here are some students um, in the fen on a boardwalk um, studying, studying the peat. And one of the things that I want to show you in this photo and again, you'll have to sort of look and gaze for a moment to see what's going on. But that pole, that skinny little pole on the left-hand side of the photo, which I'm uh, pointing to in this, in this photo, um, 
look at it, it sort of arches up and is hanging over that tree, over that cedar tree that's next to me in the photo. What we did is we took these pe these poles, which are chimney sweep rods, and we stuck them down into the peat until we hit bottom. We, you can see that is the length of poles that we needed to hit bottom. And it's hard to tell how long that is, but it's about 23 feet of poles that we needed before we hit bottom. So here we are sitting on a boardwalk, sitting on the surface of this peatland. And underneath us is 23 feet of partially decomposed organic matter or peat. This is, um, this is one of the things that's just, just so fascinating to me about peatlands. And this explains, doesn't it, if, if so many peatlands are like this, that there's vegetation on the surface and then a couple of dozen feet worth of peat underneath you. Think about that, translate that to volume. That is a lot of stored carbon in that peatland. And so this, this uh, statement that, the, that is made that peatlands store so much of the world's carbon um, is, is not surprising when you really think about it, of, of the depth of the peat in some of these places. Okay, so here's what you've been waiting for and what I've been waiting for. One of my favorite, favorite plants of fens, of calcareous fens, um, showy lady slipper. I love showy lady slipper, um, just can't get enough of it. Um, there it is in, um, in its full glory in Chickering Bog, um, it does grow there. And then this photograph was taken in Eshqua Bog, another bog, so both of these bogs are owned and managed um, by the Nature Conservancy, and you can visit them. This was taken just a couple of weeks ago in Eshqua Bog in Heartland. There is the fruit of the showy lady slipper. So the fruit of, of uh, orchids and um, other lady slippers and other orchids is this pod type fruit. Um, so that's, that's what it looks like. Um, I didn't see a lot, this is a different fen. This is not either chickering or, um, Eshqua bog, this is a different fen that's sort of hidden away and um, not accessible, but uh, but um, I didn't, when I was in that fen, I saw a lot of showy lady slipper. I mean, the place was just covered with it, but um, not a lot of fruits. So I don't know what that's all about. One of the things I did see was evidence of deer browse. There's a lot of deer in there. I saw a deer when I was in there and uh, they they like orchids. Um, so they are kind of a problem when it comes to orchids. But this is that fen again, and just a profusion of showy lady slippers in that fen. They were just everywhere. Well, one of the other pink orchids that we love is this one, grass pink, um, which you can see from the boardwalk at Chickering Bog. Uh, what a gift that is, Chickering Bog and its boardwalk, um, because you can see a lot of, of this um, of these plants, these beautiful orchids from there. And there's another view of it. Rose Pagonia, another pink orchid that you can see from the boardwalk at Chickering Bog. Arethusa, or grass pink orchid, another one of the beautiful pink orchids. These are just, both, all three of these are like six inches tall, very small plants, um, gorgeous and just uh, absolutely amazing. And there's another photo of the uh, Arethusa or the grass pink orchid um, sort of hanging out under some shrubs. You can see the dappled light there where it's, it's just getting a little bit of shade. Another orchid that grows in fens is uh, this, this one called um, bog candles. It's in the genus Platanthera. It's called bog candles and it's beautifully fragrant. It smells like vanilla. There's a picture of, of, of the whole, almost the whole stalk of the plant. We also have goldenrods that grow in fens. This one's called bog goldenrod. And there it is looking a little, uh, get a little bit of a closer view. Another member, and then that's a member of the aster family, right? And the other, there are other members of the aster family that grow in fens. And this is one called golden ragwort very common in fens and in this in this photo. So I took all these photos on this particular day that, that are of certain plants, but like always there's 
showy lady slipper in the background. The whitish spots are showy lady slipper. There's so much showy lady slipper there. There's a close-up view of the ragwort, and so you can see it looks like a little tiny, um, a little tiny sunflower. Um, it's in a different genus, but uh, and there's the fruits of it. Typical um, aster, aster family fruits, uh, just like dandelion. And there's one of those little tiny fruits sitting on the leaf of the golden ragwort. So you can see what the leaf looks like. Another member of the aster family, this is a thistle, right? You can recognize this as a thistle, but this one is swamp thistle. It's kind of a rare thistle. And again, you can see the showy lady slippers in the background in this photo, but there's a closer view and some insects visiting that um, swamp thistle. This one, thanks to my friend John Tagliaferro for this gorgeous photo of bog bean or buck bean and uh, really fascinating flowers. And there's the leaf of it um, with a blue darner sitting on the leaf. Iris, uh, blue flag iris is another plant that grows in fens. That's just uh, one of my, it's, it's a common enough plant, but I just love it. And this was a really fun photo because you can see um, beneath, just beneath the flower, there's actually a spider back there. And I kept crawling around and around the plant to try to get a photo of the spider. And it, it just kept moving around, <laughs> it just kept moving around. So I just, all I could do was get this angle, um, you know, with the, with the legs showing, but not the whole spider. Um, but this is blue flag iris, our native iris um, growing in that same fan. Now, another really interesting carnivorous plant that grows, you can see there's, there's um, this is in a fen, and you can see that there's pitcher plant in this photo. This is a terrible photo, but let's look a little closer. And this is uh, called horned bladderwort. This is a bladderwort. And this is actually also a carnivorous plant. Um, and there's a, there's a, um, I don't have a, a photo of it because it's underground, but under underneath the peat, surface in the water um, on the on the underground stems there are these little uh, devices that trap insects and so it'll trap the insect under underwater and um, and digest it there another plant that grows commonly in fens is this one um, lobelia uh, blanket on the name it'll come to me in a second it's lots of different sedges. Um, oh, Calm's lobelia, K-A-L-M, Calm's lobelia. Uh, and then there's a lot of different sedges. Again, look, there's the showy lady slipper in the background in this photo. And this is called um, yellow sedge, uh, Carex flava or yellow sedge, very common in fens. Really beautiful little sedge. This one's called uh, Rhynchospora alba or white beak rush. It grows in fens. This is another, this is called sterile sedge. This is a very rare plant that grows in fens. Thanks to Jennifer Garrett for this photo. This is one of my favorites. Um, this is called uh, alpine cotton grass, a uh, little tiny, tiny cotton grass it grows commonly in fens. And there's a close up, another close up of it. Just love that plant. Um, that's another photo of the sterile sedge. There's the there's another photo of the white beak rush. Another photo, <laughs> and then here's a oh here's a different um, a different cotton grass. This one is called green keeled cotton grass. This is another probably of the the uh, cotton grasses that I've showed you. The tawny cotton grass and this one, the green keeled cotton grass, are the two most common um, that we have in our peatlands. Here's another sedge called mud sedge that grows in um, in calcareous wetlands or calcareous fens. Um, and this one is called twig rush. Um, and that is, this is actually quite a rare plant. Um, this is a very close up view of the twig rush. It, it's a plant that grows about two or three feet tall. And these clusters that you're looking at here, that thing is about mm, a quarter to a half, a half an inch broad, very tiny, so it's a close up. Another sedge that grows in fens, this one is Schweinitz's sedge, and this is a very rare plant that we have found in a few fens in, in southwestern Vermont in Bennington County. Now moving away from the sedges to the rose family, 
Um, this is a plant called um, water avens, beautiful thing. And this is fascinating because there are several things that members of se several plants that the the members of the family that occur in fens and bogs are red, whereas the rest of the members of the family are not red. So avens, the avens uh, that we know, most of them are yellow or white, um, but this one is, is red and there's the, or, or pinkish, there's the flower and the fruit together. And again, there is the, the flower, um, quite reddish and pink fruit again. And there's the leaves of it. And this one, another one that, uh, this is marsh sink foil that grows in fens. It's a sink foil. All of our sink foils are yellow, but this one happens to be quite red. What that's all about, I don't know. It might have to have to do with um, the, the, the uh, exposure to sun. I, I just don't know what, what that is. And there's a close up view of that marsh sink foil. Mosses, there's lots of different kinds of mosses in fens that most, you know, many of them are actually not sphagnum mosses, um, but there are a bunch of different mosses that grow in fens and we collectively call some of these so-called brown mosses. And you can see why this has got a brownish hue to it. And thanks to Eric Sorensen um, and some other colleagues for these photos uh, and Jennifer Garrett again. Um, and here's here's one of the um, mosses that grows in fens with some, you can see there's some sundew growing within it. This one's starry moss, this one here. And um, so uh, that's, that's pretty much, we're running out of time here. So that's pretty much the tour of bogs and fens and their wildflowers and vegetation. Um, I wanna close with just a few recommendations of things that you could read. Um, this is a book by Ron Davis called Bogs and Fens of the Northeastern United States, a guide to the peatland plants of the Northeastern United States and adjacent, adjacent Canada. Ron Davis was one of my mentors in college at the University of Maine, introduced me to bogs um, in part when I was a, an undergrad at the University of Maine. And I believe this is a picture of Orono bog, which was one of the first bogs that I encountered um, as, a, as an undergrad. This is an old book, uh, it might be out of print, The Book of Swamp and Bog, and it's, it's pretty good. Um, this is a wonderful resource, Mosses of the Northern Forest, a photographic guide by Jerry Jenkins. This is available as a book. It's also available online um, through the Northern Forest Atlas. Look that up, it's a massively incredible resource. Um, another book about mosses is this book by Cyrus McQueen, A Guide to the Peat Mosses, Peat Mosses of Boreal North America. That is the sphagnum mosses. Cyrus was my lab roommate um, um, in when I was a, in graduate school. Just a fascinating person, um, incredibly like devoted to the study of sphagnum mosses, and um, ended up writing this this book about it. Um, He's no longer with us, but he left behind this fabulous book. Bogs of the Northeast, this one I believe is out of print too, but a really classic um, book by Charles Johnson on Bogs of the Northeast. And then this is perhaps, uh, th this is one of the most recent books that I'm aware of, a really, really important um, book by Annie Prue called Thin, Bog and Swamp, A Short History of Peatland Destruction and Its Role in the Climate Crisis. So she is referring to that fact that the peatlands of, of uh, the world hold so much of the world's carbon and, um, and how over, over time they have, they have basically been, many bogs have been mined and drained and ditched and, and destroyed and that carbon sent into the atmosphere. Um, so it's really, it's something that not everybody knows about or understands. Um, and this is a really important book. And then I already advertised this one. Uh, so now I wanna finally, uh, not finally, but I wanna close with um, a few places that you can go and visit. Uh, Chickering Bog has already been mentioned because it has a fabulous boardwalk. Thanks so much to the Nature Conservancy for this. Uh, they, um, they're, they're just, it's just a fabulous resource. This is the parking area for Chickering Bog. This is not the bog itself, obviously, but this is the parking area. 
and there is the the interpretive sign um just as you're approaching the bog that's my friend carolyn goodwin kiefner who is just so excited to go to chickering bog and you can see in this sign um chickering bog contrary to its name chickering bog is actually a fan fens are fed by groundwater carrying important nutrients from the underlying bedrock like calcium and magnesium so it has it's a really nice informational sign um with fabulous photos by by um great people and uh, and so another one that i've mentioned is colchester bog um in Colchester, right off of Airport Park, easy to get to. It's got a boardwalk, and the sign says, please stay on the boardwalk. And there's the Rodora in the background. Um, but there's the boardwalk itself with, uh, with the um, sheep laurel growing right through it. Um, here is the boardwalk to Eshqua Bog, um, the bog in, um, actually, this is a different one. So this is Eshqua Bog, and here's the sign posts for Eshqua Bog. It is a place of pilgrimage, really, um, because the showy lady slippers bloom there in the in uh, late June. And I was there just a couple weeks ago. And um, lots of people were there enjoying it and staying on the boardwalk, but enjoying the showy lady slippers in bloom. So thanks again to the Nature Conservancy for this wonderful preserve. Um, this one is um, Maquam Bog in, um, in Missisquoi Wild life management area, you can't actually get into the bog, um, but you can walk along this old railroad passage trail and, and be very close to right alongside the bog. And there's the trail. In the winter, you can leave the trail and, and go into the bog, but in the summer, no. It's just, it's A, you, you don't want to destroy the bog by doing that, and B, you might not come back. <laughs> Uh, here's another visitable bog. Um, this is one that I knew way before it had this infrastructure. Um, it's uh, called Molly Beatty Bog, uh, named for um, one of my early mentors in my career, but Molly Beatty, who's an important conservationist from Vermont, went out to Wyoming um, and uh, was important, was one of the key people in reintroducing wolves to Yellowstone. Uh, but uh, this, this bog boardwalk and access is named for her. Um, this is Springfield, a bog in Springfield, Vermont, which is uh, managed by Scutney Audubon, so a good place to look up. Um, and then Peach and Bog, Peach and Bog Fragile Area in Groton State Forest. Love this sign. And there is the access to Peach and Bog. And it's got really nice signage to explaining what, what goes on in the bog. Okay, so there's a couple places you can visit. I want to leave a few minutes for questions, but just, just a little bit about conservation now, finally, to close. Uh, remember the cranberry bog that I talked about from my childhood? Well, it's now a nature preserve. It's just awesome. It was just, a, it was just a commercial cranberry bog at the time, and now it is a nature preserve. So that's changed, and it's wonderful. Um, the Jonesport Heath, which I was told was not important because it had been mined, this is a it's now in the in the register of important natural areas in Maine, and there's this whole write up on it. So this is this, this is the Jonesport Heath. Um, and then there is uh, a few years ago in 2018, Ireland actually closed its peat mining to commercial to commercial use. Um, so that what I saw when I was there a couple of years ago was a private peat bog where somebody was still allowed to harvest, but for commercial use, it's not allowed anymore because it's known to be a finite resource, which is amazing. This is an amazing turn in conservation that people have begun to see this. So, um, and again, this global peatlands assessment, the state of the world's peatlands is a wonderful, wonderful report that just came out last year. Uh, from the UN, the G Global Peatlands Initiative, and I, I recommend having a look at it and doing what you can to protect peatlands, bogs and fens in your on your land, on land in your town, uh, land in your state, and get involved in conservation with the organizations like Northeast Wilderness Trust, the Nature Conservancy, Vermont Land Trust, other organizations that protect um, protect natural areas. So that's, uh, I'm going to turn it back over. That's what I have. And I, I want to thank you again for having me here and turn it back over to Maya. Thank you so much, Liz. And we'll just squeeze in a couple questions here. Um, and, you know, maybe 
you touched on this already, I think, but um, Darcy asks, how is climate change affecting the bogs and fens of the world? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's affected by the bogs and fens and their mining, um, but also how climate change is affecting it is affecting their vegetation and the processes. The processes of peat formation um, are 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 affected by climate change. It's it's sort of w way complicated for me to get into here, but um, but as as uh, as the climate changes, the vegetation changes and peat accumulation therefore changes. Yeah, thank you. Um, here's a question. Do all bogs tend to have the same plant species or does it vary by region? It varies quite a bit by region. I showed a couple photos of the coast of Maine and there's plants that grow there that don't grow here in Vermont, but there's a great universality to it. If you go to the coast of Maine or to Minnesota or to Labrador, you'll see a lot of the same plants in bogs, a lot of the same um, heath shrubs, in particular, same sphagnum mosses, very, very similar throughout the region. Go to Europe, uh, Eurasia, Siberia, then you'll find very different species, but in North America, yeah. Um, great, thank you. Here's a question. What causes the trees in the bog to have the lollipop top? Uh, it is, it is, um, th there's a couple of different things. One is there's actually the, um, you know what, I'm going to defer that question and answer it um, a different way later. It's, it's just too complicated for me to get to here. So if we could go on to the next question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Melissa asks, what is a deer browse line? Oh yeah, I didn't really explain that. So white-tailed deer love northern white cedar. And it's one of their favorite foods. So in the winter in Chickering Bog and other, other peatlands where they can walk on the peatland surface easily, actually they can walk on the peatland surface all summer, but they will, um, they will browse and, and eat the uh, cedar up to the point where up to you know, the, the height that they can reach. So you see that browse line and you see it on lake shores and you see it in, in, in your own backyard if you have northern white cedar and you have, and you have white-tailed deer. Great, thank you. And we're, we're just about at eight o'clock, so I think we'll stop there. Um, but, and I'm sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions, but thank you so much everyone for joining us. Um, here you'll see some upcoming events that we are hosting at the Vermont Land Trust. Um, three, uh, four in-person events. One is our annual celebration. So if any of these are near you, we'd love to see you there. Um, when you exit this webinar, you'll um, you'll have a survey pop up. We'd love your feedback if you'd like to share that with us. Um, and thank you again, Liz, um, for just taking the time to be here with us. It was really a terrific presentation and um, so glad that you could share it with us. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, everyone. All right, have a good night and stay safe out there.